Good morning. And as ever, a very warm welcome to morning worship here at St. Andrew's and St. George's West. Special welcome to any visitors who join us today. Tea and coffee will be served uh, in the undercroft at the close of the service downstairs. Uh, please do join us for continuing fellowship then. Uh, a welcome also to the unseen participants who come to us via live streaming. Uh, Whatever you are, we're delighted that you're with us, even if virtually, and hope you will feel involved meaningfully in the service. Uh, intimations, um, just to highlight one, um, on behalf of Christian Aid at uh, St. Andrews and George's West, a retired minister, uh, now living in Ardrossan, has generously offered us a quantity of special books, and uh, Mary Davison would be pleased to hear from anyone who can suggest a way for these books to be transported across from Ardrossan to Edinburgh. So if anyone has any thoughts on that, please do speak to Mary at the end of the service. Marion and I, Marion can't be with us today, unfortunately. She, we wish to thank you all for the many kind of birthday wishes that uh, came to us over this past week. Um, and uh, particular thanks for the wonderful birthday cakes that uh, were provided last Sunday, no fewer than three, and uh, some of the candles that we blew out, but uh, particular thanks to the talented bakers who did us so proud, so we're most grateful to everyone for your kindness. Our call to worship from Psalm 26. The words in bold are um, your response. Prove me, O Lord, and try me. For your steadfast love is before my eyes. O Lord, I love the house in which you dwell. As for me, I will walk in my integrity. My foot stands on level ground. Let's worship God. Is standing to sing our first hymn, number 127 in the hymn book. Oh, worship the King, all glorious above.
please be seated. So let's unite together in prayer. Let us all pray. Our gracious God, as we unite in worship this morning, we give thanks for the promise of your constant and abiding presence with us and with all your children. Down the ages, you have remained faithful to your promise, despite our many follies and our waywardness. And now in this, our time, and in difficult and uncertain days, we know we can count on you, our God, as we turn to you again and wait on your grace and guidance and help. We pray, pray your blessing on all your people who are around the world and in various contexts and forms, face to face and virtually, unite as we do in worship and praise this morning. On the first day of the week, we remember with joy that our Saviour rose again to die no more and to bring to completion your glorious plan of new creation. We thank you that the risen Christ continues to build his church and for the privilege that is ours as his followers to be fellow workers with him in the enabling of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the fresh hope that he has given us. We need encouragement, and we pray that as we attend to your worship and word, you will speak to our hearts and set our feet on solid rock. As we confess our sins and weakness, May we rejoice in the knowledge of your full forgiveness and acceptance. For if we confess our sins, your word tells us, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And as those who have been forgiven, may we have grace always in turn to extend forgiveness to others. Graciously receive our persons and our prayers as we offer them in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, continuing to pray the words that he taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us in the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We share the peace. The peace of Christ be with you all. Do share the peace with one another. Let's pray. God of peace and grace, we know that you want justice rolling down like water. Accept from our hands the offerings we bring in whatever form today and each day. We cast them upon the waters of your love, a generous ever-flowing stream, proclaiming good news, feeding the hungry, and helping those in need. Graciously accept us and all our gifts for the work of your church and the building of your kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 
we sing our next hymn, number one, two, three, in the hymn book, God is Love, Let Heaven Adore Him. Old Testament reading is from the book of the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 15, verses 15 to 21. Jeremiah's complaint and God's reassurance. Listen for the word of God. O oh Lord, you know. Remember me and visit me, and bring down retribution for me on my persecutors. In your forbearance, do not take me away. Know that on your account I suffer insult. Your words were found, and I ate them, and your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. I did not sit in the company of merrymakers, nor did I rejoice. Under the weight of your hand I sat alone, for you had filled me with indignation. Why is my pain unceasing, my wound incurable, refusing to be healed? Truly, you are to me like a deceitful brook, like waters that fail. Therefore, says the Lord, if you turn back, I will take you back and you shall stand before me. If you utter what is precious and not what is worthless, you shall serve as my mouth. It is they who will turn to you, not you who will turn to them. And I will make you to these, this people a fortified wall of bronze. They will fight against you, but they will not prevail over you. For I am with you, to save you and deliver you, says the Lord. I will deliver you out of the hand of the wicked and redeem you from the grasp of the ruthless. Here 
Adam's the first lesson. The New Testament lesson is from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 16, verses 21 to 28. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. May God bless to us these readings from his holy word. We continue in worship singing our next hymn number 549 in the hymn book. How deep the Father's love for us.
God of truth and grace, we praise you for your word, the word you have given us to direct our feet in the way of peace. Come, Holy Spirit, shine your light in our hearts, that we may see the light and the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Amen. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Those of you with a strong memory may recall that today's lectionary gospel reading forms a kind of sequel to an episode we looked at together some time ago. It's the one where Jesus took his disciples up to Caesarea Philippi, a modern Banyas, in, up in the foothills of Mount Hermon, close to the source of the River Jordan. It was about a two-day walk from the Sea of Galilee, and well outside the, the territory of that nasty piece of work, Herod Antipas, uh, whose intent in regard to Jesus was murderous, Vladimir Putin-like, assassination was the only way this cheerful chappy knew how to deal with those whom he perceived as a threat to his power. The episode up there at Caesarea Philippi was a pivotal moment in Jesus' ministry and in the life of his disciples. Jesus' Galilean ministry was over. He and his disciples were soon to set off for Jerusalem and all that awaited him there. He took his disciples up to Caesarea Philippi to disclose to them his great intent and purpose in the world in, a, in short hand to build for himself a church. And he clearly wanted to share with them, as with us, the most important defining characteristics of the church he is building. He brings us back to basics, never a bad thing in the midst of uncertainty and change in the Christian community. Jesus addresses head on the fundamental question, what on earth is the church? So this Caesarea Philippi episode covers 16 verses of Matthew 16 in two equal parts, each of eight verses. In each of these, Jesus discloses to his followers one major defining characteristic of the community that he is building. In the first, the one we looked at last time, we discover that the church is the community of those who confess Jesus as the unique Messiah. Remember how having heard from his disciples a variety of notions as to who people thought he was, he puts them the question, but you, who do you say I am? And Peter, always quick, responded for them all, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. It was a sincere and heartfelt confession. Indeed, Jesus said it came from the Father's revelation to Peter of the truth of Jesus' identity. And that very confession itself brings the church into being. We're reminded that for us Christians, it just isn't enough to praise Jesus as a great teacher or a great prophet. He was both, but he was so much more. God's anointed and promised Messiah and Son embodying uniquely both Israel and humanity's true vocation on the one hand and embodying the living God himself on the other. And there is no church without that confession. But now for a moment, the second part, the verses that we heard read to us a little while ago, our gospel reading this morning. The disciples had confessed Jesus to be the Messiah. Great. 
So far, so good. They were now ready to move on, as it were, to stage two. For what Jesus is saying to them and us in our reading is that his church, to be sure, is the community of those who confess Jesus as Lord, as God's unique Messiah. It is also the community of those who follow Jesus as the the suffering Messiah. Now, that takes the definition onto a new level. Our passage opens. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Now we can imagine the shock, the horror with which Peter, Andrew, John and the rest received this announcement. After all, they just confessed Jesus to be the true Messiah. Messiahs aren't supposed to suffer. They come to end suffering, don't they? They lead their followers to victory, don't they? Not to death, for heaven's sake. And who's going to inflict this suffering that he's talking about? Well, for a start, the leaders of the very nation whose Messiah he is. You know, if, if, if the setting had been Scottish, just to, just to make the point more vivid, you might say the Scottish Parliament, the General Assembly, and the divinity faculties. The Messiah comes to his own. And as John the Apostle says, his own do not receive him. And for many people, this rejection in itself will prove that he's a phony. You know, there, there, I think there's a sort of resonance here with the situation we're facing in these, it sometimes feels the strangest of times when sadly, individual lives are being destroyed simply because some crazed ideologues, devotees of a secular religion utterly devoid of the concepts of grace and forgiveness, decide they are unworthy and must be cancelled forevermore. It's madness and it's happening. Have a word with our own J.K. Rowling. For Jesus, it is simply the way of God's servant. His disciples need to get rid of two ideas. That to be Messiah means pomp and power. And also this, that the religious leadership will be his main body of support. No, they won't. They become tragically his main enemies. And it's so hard to take in. God's Messiah won't die of a broken heart or old age. He will be executed, put to death as a public nuisance. Of course, Jesus spoke also of resurrection, but that part of what he said was drowned out by the shock and horror of the rest. And Peter is appalled by the prospect that was being unfolded before him. I wonder if what Jesus had said to him about this rock had given him a, a new sense of responsibility. And so how we, we've got this semi-comic scene in which Peter takes the master aside to save Jesus' embarrassment, you see, and administers a loving and well-meant rebuke God forbid, Lord, this can never happen to you. God's own Messiah can't possibly suffer in this way. And maybe Peter thought, I'm not signing up as Pope for this. That's a little um, touch of humor. Peter meant well with his protestations, of course, but Jesus was having none of it. He sternly retorted, Get behind me, Satan. As if to say, you've become my biggest problem, Peter. 
You got it right when you called me Messiah. But half the content you poured into that word was plain wrong. You need to get behind me. That's the place for a disciple. Following Jesus, not patronizing him, obeying him, not correcting him. And you can see immediately why Jesus wanted them to keep quiet about him being the Messiah. Because they had the truth, but they had it in the wrong way. As someone said, even the most prized of Jesus' disciples can be repellent to him. So there's a red card here for all forms of triumphalism in the church. See, the worldliness of Peter was all the more dangerous for being so well meant. When we try to defend Jesus or his followers from the path of suffering, which is the true messianic way, we become, he says, like devils. Satan always leads up, aspiring to success and power and greatness. God leads down the way of the cross. See, it's not enough for the church to be Christ-centered. It must also be cross-centered. Leave out the centrality of the cross and everything is skewed because the cross is absolutely central in God's redemptive plan for the world. Jesus would lay down his life on our behalf and on behalf of the world. He would shed his blood for us. And the church is only the church when the center of her worship and gratitude can be expressed. I would suggest in the words of the great children's hymn by Cecil Francis Alexander, there is a green hill far away outside a city wall where the dear Lord was crucified who died to save us all. We may not know, we cannot tell what pain he had to bear, but we believe it was for us he hung and suffered there. Now that's the dimension of messiahship that Jesus had now begun to teach his followers because the salvation of the world depended on it. It was a costly path for Jesus. And it was going to be costly for his followers too. Now we don't have time to look at the passage in detail, but Jesus speaks words of enormous significance about what it means to be a disciple then and now in the church of Jesus Christ, to be a full-time disciple. And I know you've been discussing full-time discipleship earlier today, and I wish I'd been there. It involves us, Jesus says, in a life of cross-bearing and self-denial. John Calvin says a quite remarkable thing. God, he says, has so ordered the church from the beginning that death is the way to life. Death is the way to life and suffering the way to victory. I'm reminded of the way in which Jim Elliot, some of you have read about him, uh, the missionary to the Auka Indians, uh, Auka Indians in Ecuador. Uh, Jim Elliot made the point memorably just before he set out to meet these Indians and become a 20th century martyr, speared to death on a beach by those he had come to serve. He said one of his last diary entries, I, if I remember right, he is no fool to give up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Is it the case, I wonder, that these dimensions of the church's identity are ones we need to maybe learn all over again? You know, with our backs to the wall in these days and uncertain uh, future beckoning us, it's arguably a good time to do that. 
in the church in recent times, we may have bought far too much into the surrounding culture of worship of consumerism, and celebrity, and success. I was struck by these words of an American seminary teacher. Quote, Christianity requires the submission of one's individual will to the Lordship of Christ. We are either in Christ on his terms and by his grace, or we aren't. Christianity doesn't work on the terms of consumerism. Jesus Christ calls his followers not to comfort and convenience, but to deny themselves and to take up their cross. In his great uh, 1934 book, The Kingdom of God in America, that great theologian H. Richard Niebuhr depicted the creed of liberal Protestant theology in words that became famous. Quote, a God without wrath brought man without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of a Christ without a cross. Now, as Professor Timothy George remarks, Niebuhr was no fundamentalist, but he knew what he was talking about. Can it be, asked the late Pope Benedict, that despite all our expressions of consternation in the face of evil and innocent suffering, we are all too prepared to trivialize the mystery of evil. Have we accepted only the gentleness and love of God and quietly set aside the word of judgment? Yet as we contemplate the suffering of the Son, we see more clearly the seriousness of sin and how it needs to be fully atoned if it is to be overcome. End of quote. That's Benedict. Jesus is teaching <clears throat> what teaching us what he wants his church to be like in any age and every age as we await his coming. The question is, will we listen and in the power of the Spirit respond as we ought? Will we turn from self the way Peter was called to do and get back behind Jesus where disciples have to be? We may have imagined the church in different ways in the past, but this is the growing church of tomorrow, the living witnessing community of those who cheerfully share in the fellowship of Christ's suffering. Full-time disciples who know that their place is always behind their Lord. And here lies the challenge before the church today as in every age. It is ours in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue in worship singing our next hymn, number 517 in the hymn book. Fight the good fight with all your might.
St Andrews and St George's West is an eco-congregation. Our prayers today, at the start of the season of creation, are adapted from the eco-congregation Scotland's website. Let us pray. Sustaining God, thank you that we rely on grace as we strive to be full-time disciples. That your will to save and heal the world asks only that we take on our part. Take up the cross that's ours, as others take up their crosses for the common good. Keep us going, God, whilst giving thanks that we can pray and help in many ways. Thank you for the sanctuary and fellowship of our church for the joyful encouragement to find meaning and help in the treasures of our faith, for the resources of the good news so we can face headlines drenched in bad news, and for the birds which still sing to greet each morning. As the season of creation begins, we are mindful of the fellow creatures on this planet, human and others, whose habitats livelihoods, customs and migrations are seriously impacted by the unjust choices of economies and cultures which lack faith. We bring to you what we've heard this week about wildfires, floods, droughts, pollution, things that are far away but closer at hand than we ever expected. May the changes in our lifestyles that we are prepared to embrace be the prayer that we offer. May our, our eyes be open to the signs of our times and our ears to the voices and personalities of creation. We pray for the joy and hope amongst all churches that is part of our commitment to live out our human calling in active partnership with the life on earth on which we depend. We pray for courage amongst our leaders to shape the conditions in which change may be rapid and just, and for peace amongst the nations and an end to the hatred of God expressed in war, where creation is always the first casualty. God, keep us going, that the worry over tomorrow does not overcome our joy, hope and commitment to the goodness of this day you have made. So we come to stand to sing our closing hymn this morning, 519, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. We stand to sing.
Go now and follow Jesus in the way of the cross. Rejoice in hope. Hold fast to what is good. Persevere in prayer. Do not be overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. As far as is possible, live peaceably with all. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest on and abide with you all this day and evermore. Mm -hmm.